In today's video, we're talking about researching your prostate cancer treatment options. There are a lot of options in prostate cancer and you wanna really make sure that you're choosing the one that is right for you and that you know what your current plan is and what your future plan is. So Dr. Mark Schultz, who's a 30 year medical oncologist focusing solely in prostate cancer, is gonna talk about the nuances and some helpful tips in order to help you research your best option. So in today's video, Dr. Scholz, we're talking about the process of choosing a treatment option for prostate cancer. Now, when a man is diagnosed, oftentimes it comes as quite a shock, and then maybe in two weeks they're scheduled for a random needle biopsy, and in most cases I see that a lot of men are scheduled for surgery quite quickly. And then they're kind of going, wait a minute, I want to know what my options are, and then when they're given those options, it can be quite overwhelming. So. You know, with these patients coming in, what's the first piece of advice you would give to a patient who has just been diagnosed, is kind of in this um, fury of just so much going on and trying to find, you know, north? Well, two words, go slow. Uh, give yourself time to process the complexity of the situation. It is fathomable with time. And fortunately with prostate cancer, men have time. Even the bad prostate cancers, even the metastatic prostate cancers, there is some time they don't uh, grow so quickly. They're not like leukemia or something that can um, explode within weeks. Uh, prostate cancer doesn't behave that way. The patients that I see that are coming in to see me are maybe a little different category than uh, the majority of patients who have prostate cancer. The patients that I see will be people who've typically been processing, have taken their time, and have thought through and studied their options. I think the more common situation is people are so back on their heels and frightened and uh, intimidated by the whole concept of, of deciding what to do that their um, natural reaction is to to delegate it to the competent expert that's sitting in front of them, the physician that did their biopsy, usually a urologist, and trust that that doctor has their best interests at heart. And I think these doctors, the urologists who do the biopsies and make the diagnosis, do have their patient's best interests at heart. I don't think there's any doubt about that. When surgeons catch prostate cancer, many of them end up having surgery themselves. They're, they're very sincere about their belief in doing an operation, and it sounds very convincing. It's cancer, let's cut it out, let's cure it. Very simple and uh, very direct. As we go into this video, I think we'll discover that there's many layers to this situation, and fortunately we do have enough time to take a step back, talk to various experts, study various materials, and then make a more measured decision about what the best treatment's going to be. Please click that subscribe button. When you do this, it tells the YouTube algorithm that this video was helpful for you and they'll push our videos out to other people who need answers when it comes to prostate cancer. Also, if you would like to join our cause, you can do so at pcri.org forward slash donate. Now back to my conversation with Dr. Scholz. So one of the key points that I find um, really resonates with our audience when they're watching these videos is that even when you're diagnosed with advanced prostate cancer, you still have time. Can you explain that? Well, it just has to do with the pace of how quickly prostate cancer grows compared to other cancers. If, if you look at mortality rates from, say, lung cancer, pancreas cancer, stomach cancer, even colon cancer, a very common cancer, when these things metastasize, the survival is measured in, sometimes in months. And in prostate cancer, if you look at the American Cancer Society statistics, for newly diagnosed men, the 10-year survival is like 98%. So we're really playing a long game with prostate cancer. Are there men dying of prostate cancer? S certainly there are, but it's often 10 or 15 years after diagnosis because of all the effective treatments we have that can forestall and postpone uh, mortality. This means that when people are recently diagnosed, they have some time even to postpone treatment for a couple months and, and think through their options without endangering their long-term cure rates. So how does a patient find these options? Because usually when they're talking to a urologist, they're kind of given maybe one, two, or three, and then they go online and they see all these different things that are marketed, which also adds confusion. And unfortunately, when you Google something, the bad news is there's a lot of information, and the good news is there's a lot of information. So how do you determine really what's right for you? I think the commonly misunderstood aspect of prostate cancer is that it's one thing. And you would hope that you could simply study about that entity 
use that information and make a decision. But the reality is that there are many different types and stages of prostate cancer. The first step, I think, is to be, familiarize yourself with this, uh, the spectrum of what we call prostate cancer. Uh, early harmless variants, uh, metastatic variants. And uh, how do you go about that? I've written a couple of books on this, and it's daunting to think about reading a book, but if you just open up the book and look at the chapters, the chapter titles, you can get an idea of the many different types of prostate cancer. Sort of um, get that into your mind, and that's a first step in getting a pathway towards what the treatment is, because if you don't understand what you have, then it's impossible to pick the best treatment for what you have. The staging process, understanding the different types of prostate cancer is an essential first step. You have to um, familiarize yourself with the whole field so that when you figure out what your stage is, you can put it in context of that bigger picture. As patients are researching this, you know, where they fit into this big scheme of prostate cancer, don't they need to double check that their data is correct? You know, I have, this is absolutely my Gleason score, this is how my PSA is acting. What do you tell your patients who are looking for maybe a confirmatory biopsy or something like that? I think that's a very good point. The selection of the grade of the cancer, interpreting scans that are arguing that there is or isn't spread to somewhere outside the prostate or to other parts of the body is an art and a skill. And it is heavily dependent on the quality of the scanning techniques and the, and the experience of the doctor who's reading the report. It's quite easy though to get these source documents, your biopsy slides or your scan uh, images and have them overread at a center of excellence. And that's a very prudent step for patients because one can, with all good intentions, go through the process of learning how to stage their system and, and, and act accordingly. But if they're starting with the wrong basic information, uh, they're going to be misled down a pathway that uh, is going to lead to suboptimal treatment. Once patients have confirmed that they know what type of prostate cancer they have, and then they have kind of looked at this overall scheme of prostate cancer. How do you narrow down your options when it seems to be there, there's so many? Well, this is the advantage of having a sense of where you are in that broader picture because options for treatment are really tailored to the different stages. Uh, if people have an intermediate risk prostate cancer, that means a, a relatively small chance of spread and, and they can have their disease just controlled by treating the prostate then you, you have a fairly long list of options, surgery, different types of radiation, cryotherapy, and, and, and many, many more. That is probably the most complex in terms of evaluating multiple treatments. As people uh, face a more advanced stage of disease, the options become more uh, clarified down to one or two choices because the situation is serious enough, you basically understand that you're gonna have to use multiple or practically all resources that are available to you. Let's take that most common situation with intermediate risk disease. You could have a list of 10 options, uh, surgery, seed implant radiation, beam radiation, proton therapy, uh, amongst which you would need to choose. And I think that the process of figuring out what to do is creating a list of options and then putting them in order of least desirable to most desirable. And then quickly, lining through the ones at the bottom of the list, and you may be left with two or three options that uh, are, uh, are relatively good choices for you to compare. One of the points that I really appreciate that you made is the fact that patients can research all the options and at least know, but the quality of life is also something that you wanna pay attention to. So when you're looking at this list, how do you prioritize quality of life while still having an impactful treatment? This is one of the confusing things about prostate cancer because with most other cancers, they're so deadly, quality of life is a lower priority. But since men are gonna live 10 or 20 years after diagnosis, quality of life becomes a huge priority in the prostate cancer world. So not only are we looking at cure rates, which are very important, and also contribute to quality of life, but we're looking at the side effects. Treatments which have relatively similar cure rates, which is often the case for our example of intermediate risk disease, then the side effect profile starts becoming the number one thing for differentiating these different options. 
you know, it can be quite overwhelming. How do you know that what you're researching and the tools that you're using to research are really quality tools to help you make the best decision? In the consumer world, that we used to have, and I think it still exists, a company called Consumer Reports, and they would uh, compare different uh, products with each other for cost, for uh, durability, and they advertised that uh, you know, they didn't have any connections with the manufacturers, that they would go buy these products off the shelf so that there was no conflict of interest. Selection of treatment in the prostate cancer world has similar priorities. One is, let's look behind the curtain. Is there a conflict of interest? Surgeons talking about surgery, radiation therapists talking about radiation, they have a major conflict of interest. And it's unlikely they're going to be able to present a level playing field even though I know sometimes they bend over backwards to try to do so. It's just a proven fact that when people have a connection to outcomes, they're going to tend to slant the, the message one way. We need to be careful in looking at these resources as where do they come from, and they also need to be quality, bona fide, uh, validated resources. I can't tell you how many times I've had patients come in and talk about the fact their next door neighbor had surgery, and he did well, and thinking that that is somehow uh, an argument in favor of surgery. About a third of people, in my experience, do very well after surgery. But those sorts of odds going in, we don't know who's going to do well before and after, uh, and then what is done is done. You can't put the prostate back afterwards. So the idea is to select a treatment option where the odds of, out of a good outcome are much higher than what we typically see with surgery. This organization was founded by you and another medical oncologist because you saw patients just being given one direction when it came to treatment. And you've really built this organization with the concept that patients need to be making informed decisions. They need to be able to calculate the risks and know whether or not this is not only the best option for me, but can I live with the outcomes of it? And what is the next step after that? They need to come with the concept that prostate cancer is quite like a chronic disease. There's a current plan and a future plan. And there's risks associated with the treatment, the side effects, am I choosing the right doctor? So how do you encourage patients with all of that is going on that they are making the right choices even though there is risk involved? I think it requires a very disciplined mindset, a, a systematic approach to, as we have sort of outlined in this video, of getting an idea of the, the broad picture of what this prostate cancer realm is, finding out your position in that realm, and then looking at the list of, of options being offered and narrowing that list down so that when you're doing your research, you're researching just two or three options. You're not being distracted by all the other information that's out there. So careful attention to those options and then ultimately being mature enough to realize that no option is going to offer 100% satisfaction because things can go badly even in rare circumstances. When it looks like everything should go fine, there can still be bad outcomes. It's inevitable that there will be some risk with whatever uh, option is chosen, and managing that risk and being aware of that risk is the, the, the nitty-gritty of what we rely upon to decide which has the least risk. If we deny the fact that there will be some risk in every option, then it is possible that we'll just be emotionally herded into some, some promise of, of uh, uh, you know, perfect outcomes, which doesn't exist. Being realistic about the fact that there are no perfect options, and this is why this organization exists. Once we have that one magic bullet, then we'll be able to, to close up operations and allow people just to have that one wonderful treatment. That doesn't exist yet. And so this complex process of narrowing down your options doing comparison shopping, not hoping that there's just like one right option. Once you've determined that this is the type of treatment that you want to do, you've assessed the risks, you know the side effects, you've kind of built a side effect mitigation plan, you at least know what's coming ahead of time. How do you determine the best doctor to do this treatment? Because there's so many men in, that are looking for, you know, sometimes they're in an insurance situation where they're set inside of a certain hospital. Sometimes they're in a community setting and they don't have access to a university. So how are they going to research the absolute best person that they can get near them to do this. So this is very important because <laughs> you could argue in some cases it might be better to get the second or third best treatment if you knew that the person giving that treatment was the best at doing it. Very skillful doctors are going to reduce side effects and improve cure rates. It's a proven fact in the prostate cancer world. Looking for quality, word of mouth, online reviews, finding other experts that are familiar with the field 
and who don't have a conflict of interest that could have insider knowledge of who the really skilled doctors are. It's a difficult issue, just if I'm trying to get a good electrician for my house or a good plumber. Uh, to know that they're skillful and have integrity is not an easy proposition. But it's foolish to not be looking for those factors because a lot of these treatments, especially for intermediate risk prostate cancer, it's, it's a one and done decision that we'll have to live with the rest of our lives. So all of this can be quite emotionally daunting, mentally daunting, you know, it's financially uh, daunting. Some men are having to take off of work. The research seems quite immense. There's so much that goes into a prostate cancer diagnosis that I realize that people who are not uh, maybe in the prostate cancer world or not a patient, they don't understand that what these people are going through. It is immense. And then choosing a treatment when you think, well, the doctor should know what they're doing. They should be telling me, why am I researching? I'm a layman. You went to medical school. And then you have these doctors who are putting pressure on patients to have a certain type of treatment. And sometimes they're in a system where, you know, maybe you're in an HMO and you have a certain set of doctors and a certain set of treatments available within that. So how do you encourage patients who are in these various situations to really take time and have peace with taking time, have peace with making their decisions when there is so much going on in that process. Well, the most consistent smart move that I see patients make is to surround themselves with a small circle of perhaps family members that help them win the process. A team is a much smarter and more powerful mental force than an individual. And the fact that the other members of the team are not oppressed by the illness itself allows them to take a step back, have a little more objectivity. The challenges of that, of course, is that the team members may not have the same quality of life valuation that the, that the patient himself does. And that has to be made clear that it's the outcomes that the patient wants to put on this process, not the, the team members. The patient may value pr preservation of potency at a higher degree than the other team members. And uh, team members uh, need to respect that and to act in light of the wishes of the person who's got the prostate cancer. If that can be accomplished, uh, I am much more comforted when I see two or three people come to a consultation who are engaged, listening, and uh, providing input than just a single individual. And the other thing, of course, I'm encouraged about, which is the very thing we've been talking about this whole video, is uh, people who've done their homework, who've had various consultations, spent time reading and learning, and then uh, many times, the conversation that I'll end up having with them is at a much higher level and allows us to come to a, a pretty satisfying conclusion. The other extreme is where people come in without any uh, preparation and we're spending most of our time educating them about the very things we're talking about today. One of the main reasons we made this video is oftentimes we see patients have treatment regret and we want to help eliminate that in the future as much as possible. Some patients, you know, were rushed into a situation and then they have lifelong side effects that they didn't know they were going to get. Everything kind of happened in a whirlwind and they didn't even have time to research their options. And other patients chose a treatment that maybe was covered within a system or someone suggested to them and it really didn't take care of the cancer in the first go around and now they're having to look at a backup plan. Whether or not you're in that situation, we want to help you as much as possible. And the things that Dr. Scholz mentioned in this video are really good to think about. I would encourage you, no matter what situation you're in, to really do take your time. You want to make sure that you feel comfortable with the decision you're making. Is this really the right treatment? Is this my type of prostate cancer? And do I trust this doctor? So a couple of things that I have done when I'm advocating for patients with cancer is I've called the office and said, how many procedures have you done? You know, are you new, just fresh? out of medical school and you have really great reviews online or is it really you have great reviews you've done this for quite some time and maybe even ask the office are there patients who have been through this process that I can talk to and if maybe the office doesn't provide that you can you know get find a local support group or a virtual support group I'll go ahead and link that in the description below because we have a lot of great options for virtual support groups and you can find patients who have been through these different treatments what their experiences were the ins and outs and those little details really help your quality of life one of my biggest pet peeves in prostate cancer is that we say this term quality of life, but oftentimes I don't think it's really prioritized. Your the experience of what you're going through when you're going through treatment, even the little things matter. You know, am I, do I have what I need after I get out of the operation or the radiation? You know, is there anything that can alleviate maybe nausea? Really speak up for yourself when you're talking to your doctor. And when you find the doctor that you think, okay, I want him to do this type of treatment, 
really make sure that he's ans like answering your questions and he's not just you know saying you do what i say and this is it you want to have a shared decision making experience where you can ask your questions and he respects you as a person and answers them it's extremely important and another thing you want to do is make sure that you know what your priorities are you know if you're going to choose a treatment and you really want to protect your sexual health when you're building your medical team when you're talking to you maybe the people supporting you you want to make sure to verbalize that because you are important, your priorities are important, and we want to make sure that quality of life and effective treatment go hand in hand. Now, if you need help knowing how to maybe prioritize your questions or even advocating for yourself, our helpline is a really great resource for that. You can contact them at pcri.org forward slash helpline. These are prostate cancer patients that can give you information, not advice, but they do a great job because they've been through these experiences and they've advocated for themselves. And they can help you, you know, not only prioritize, but also share more information Information about the treatments that you're researching. Now, if you would like to, you know, donate and join our cause, you can do so at pcri.org forward slash donate. But the most important thing I want to remember is please take care of your emotional health, your spiritual health, your mental health, get support, you know, get friends around you, family, talk about it because you're going through a lot and we want to make sure that you are not alone. I wish I was there to help you personally, but the resources that we're sharing in the description below this video and what you do through reaching out is really important. Thank you so much for trusting us and I hope you have a great week.